That will that never, never work. work. You can't, can't publish that. Seriously? Don't. Don't. Oh, my God. That's good. Oh, my God. That's bad. You, you probably, probably should find a hobby. You ever, you ever learn how to sell? Stop. Stop. Be happy. Quit while you're in the middle. Don't bother me. I've seen good news. Do you really want to do it? And bro, my third grade, give it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 51 of Horrible Writing. I am Paul Sadine, your host. And we are doing another author interview in the series of author interviews. This time around, I have with me author M.K. Chester. M.K., thank you for joining me on Horrible Writing. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. I really, um, I'm really interested to hear your story. I don't know a whole lot of your story, so I get to explore it with you here live on the uh, podcast recording. But there's a lot of things that I am already ascribing to your story. And not that I want validation, but I feel like you're going to have a really powerful, very uh, encouraging, empowering story. Um, So I can't wait to dig into the details of this. Now, you and I did some chatting before uh, before this interview uh, and selecting, you know, what aspect of your story we were going to tell. And you you gave me a couple personal details about your story. So I'd like to jump right in those. Um, One of my challenges with the writer community as a very driven, motivated person is folks who say they're too busy to write, but they really, really, really want to write. But I've got all these things. Now, for you, you are you've got some stuff we're going to talk about going on in your life uh, during the course of this interview. But you're also and you have been uh, married to the military, if you will, and you're a mom. So you, you've got the health stuff we're going to get into, the military stuff, and the mom stuff. So right off the bat, with all of those things you're juggling, how do you find the time to write? Um, it's, it's really difficult. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I got married about 10 years ago, and I lived my single life up until that point. I'm a true introvert. I'm, you know... Myers Briggs Dow. I'm I'm good. I'm I'm an introvert forever, and you know I would go home after work and and sit my butt down in a chair and I would write until I got tired and I'd go to bed and get up. You know, and it was no big deal. I had my job. I'd come home and write, and that was very fulfilling for me. Um, when I got married, uh, he had an eight year old son um, who lives with us, and so you know I instantly became a mom to an elementary school student. And, um, and all of those things, which might change my job, moved, all, you know, all these things kind of happened at once. We got married, we moved. I had a kid, <laughs> an eight-year-old kid um, who is adorable and, and wonderful, and we'll talk about him later, I'm sure. But finding the time to write was, was a challenge. So I would write on lunch hours. I would go into work maybe in, a little bit early if I had a dead, don't tell my bosses, but if I had a <laughs> dead spot in the day. I would open that document and work on it. And that's basically how I got some stuff done. You know, um, when he got deployed, then of course I had more time on my hands, um, just because he was not there Mm. to take up any of that, that time. How did you, that's one of the things I love picking other people's brains about, um, in regards to, like you said, you know, catching those breaks on work and, and pulling that document up. How easy was it for you to catch that flow again? Um, if you you were working on this project at work and then you pop open that Word document and try to get back into your story, how easy was that for you? And did you find anything that helped you catch the rhythm again? It's it's fairly easy for me, generally speaking. Not to say that there aren't moments when it's difficult, but but generally speaking, I don't have a hard time with that. I use music a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'll develop soundtracks for what I'm working on and certain songs will, you know, resonate for certain scenes or characters. And so I use music a lot to help me get, get back into that place. Verbal, uh, with lyrics or instrumental? Both. Really? I cannot mm-hmm. do lyrics. I get so distracted. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my writing kryptonite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I used to write term papers with music blaring and people thought that was, that was weird. So. <laughs> 
Hey, whatever works for people, right? Whatever works. Right. Now, how often did your husband deploy? He had uh, two deployments. Uh, one was before we married, and I didn't know him at that time. Um, but that's important in his son's life because, you know, his son was very young at that time. So um, he deployed pretty much right after we got married. Okay. Because so I, I do yeah. find it interesting that um, the way you answered that was that it was, you know, air quotes easier to write while he was gone because you had more time. And those times, I don't know if non-military people appreciate how hectic those things are for uh, the family that's left behind because you're, no. you're handling everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and on one hand, I had been used to handling a lot of things because I was, you know, mid-30s and single. I handled everything about my life, and, you know, that was fine. Um, you know, so then I was married and I had, you know, a, a, the child. So it was three times as many things to handle. So then I went back down to two times as many things to handle, which was <laughs> slightly better, I guess. Well, you know, and, and that's interesting. Did you find yourself, you know, when life settled back down again, was that disruptive or was it an, uh, an opportunity for you to identify maybe wasteful practices that helped you write more? Um, no, I don't think it ever actually slowed down, to okay. be honest with you. You know, they say that, you know, when your significant other is deployed, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Mm -hmm. Cars breaking down right and left. I had appliances I had to replace. I had school functions. I had, you know, work functions. I had all of these things. And so I don't really think it slowed down that much. My writing time reappeared in the evenings. Okay. After my son went to bed and, you know, I could be, I could have my laptop in the bed and write until I've got tired and go, and go to sleep. And so that's where my writing time reappeared. Is it, um, was that a common practice for you? The, the evening writing time? Yes. Okay. Because I'm, I'm just curious how flexible you are because I admire people who can write, you know, with flexibility. I can't, if I don't do it first thing in the morning, it, it's like the, by the time the work day is done, my, the creative bank account's been drained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get that. And to be honest, I've not tried the structured way because I've always had the, the nine to five job and all of that. So, you know, when I've never had the option to set a schedule and get up first thing in the morning and go do it. Now that I've, you know, been unemployed for a year and I'm self-employed, I, I could definitely do that. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should, I don't know. <laughs> Well, you know, and I, you know, one of the things I do like about this show is being able to talk to other writers and find out what works for them. And it just, I mean, it constantly reinforces that, the, you know, the principle that what, whatever works, as long as it's working for you, you know, it, it, you know, there, I don't, I would be the last one to uh, prescribe a rule set for folks. As long as folks are writing, you got writers, you got to be writing. You it's just write. how it is. You have to write. So, my experience with the military was uh, that it's incredibly disruptive. The military member has it tough enough, but I really feel for the military family. The military member moves just like the family does. Uh, they deploy and the family gets left behind. Uh, but w like when they move, they have that almost immediate structure. When they get to the new location, they already ha they have that job. They have a circle of coworkers already prescribed to them and the family member doesn't have that luxury. So for you, when it came to that lifestyle, were there tips, tools, and tactics that you used to help you kind of get through that ebb and flow of life changes? My husband um, uh, is the youngest of seven. Wow. And so, yeah. <laughs> so um, we, we, all kind of live within um, a 60 mile radius, except for one older sister. And, um, and so I relied on them quite a bit. They, they lived in the same vicinity as me. There was, there were a couple, a couple families that, that lived there. And, you know, we would oftentimes structure our week around going out to grandma's house, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we developed a little bit of a schedule around that. Um, and then, I, I have some really good friends that I made at work. I, you know, I did probably what three of the most stressful five things you can do in your life, move, got married and had a child, <laughs> changed my job, you know, all of that within 
weeks of, of one another. And so, but I, I was lucky to find some really good supportive people where I work also. And so that was, that was very helpful too. Yeah. Because I mean, in that context, when you think about it, that's an easy way to throw you. It would, I would imagine, because I know people that it's an easy uh, way to throw you completely out of the writing rhythm, like where you don't touch a keyboard again for years because of all, like what you experienced or going through all those things in such a condensed period of time. Yeah, I, and I did that, and and I and I thought, well, I'm just going to sit back until things settle down. But then, as I realized things weren't really going to settle down, right? Like they used to be when I was single. Then, um, you know, you have to adapt to that. So it, it's, if you think about it, you know, it could be a conscious choice or a subconscious choice, but but you make a choice at that point, right? No, and that's, and again, that's very empowering. And that's the right message for us to be sending to each other to encourage each other. And I love how you frame that. that you realized this is it. It's not settling down. No. So writers who do maybe do that, you don't have to raise your hand, but listen to what MK's advice is. Uh, kick the crutch away, start walking because it ain't changing. That's it's that thing called life. Now, MK, as if you didn't have enough going on, with all of that stuff, uh, the job stuff, the instant family stuff, the marriage, and, and obviously associated deployment issues with a military spouse, uh, you had other things that you were facing, some health things. Um, I don't want to speak to your story for you. Would you mind sharing the parts of your story that you're comfortable sharing and what you're facing? Sure, sure. Um, right after my husband was deployed, I, I my left hand started to go numb. And like any good office worker slash writer, I thought, well, I'm developing carpal tunnel syndrome. I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to go to the doctor. They're going to give me a cortisone shot and a wrist brace, and I'm going to be just fine. And so that's what happened. I went to the general practitioner. She, you know, if there's nothing broken, probably blah, 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 be it based on what you do. Here's my diagnosis. And so I, I went back and it should get better and it doesn't get better. And I'm like, okay, now the numbness is moving up my arm. And that's kind of weird. I don't know that carpal tunnel does that. So I had this weird numbness in my body and it progressed from my left arm. And then I noticed it in my left foot and it starts crawling up my leg. And I'm like, okay, even weirder, but I'm so busy. I don't have time to go back and follow up with the doctor. I'm like, okay, everything's still functioning perfectly fine. It's just like my hand is asleep or my foot is asleep. Everything still works. So I'm like forging ahead. And so I forge ahead and I clearly remember leaving work one night and I was exhausted. It must've been the end of the week. And I, and I leaned back in my car and rested my head on the, on the headrest. And I realized that the back of my head was also numb. Oh, wow. And it was, and I'm like, wow, how much, how much longer until this goes around to my face? Cause you know, I'm a woman, nobody wants that. You know, nobody mm. wants to have, you know, their, their face affected. Right. So affect the rest of my body, but don't touch my face. Um, and it was the weirdest thing because it was exactly half of my body. It was the left half of my body. And I'm like, okay, this is weird. So I started to go back through, saw the general practitioner again, you know, got the referral to whoever I was supposed to go to next. And I went to that doctor and, you know, they're like, it could be this and that. And nobody had any real answers. Well, by the time I had gone to a couple of those appointments, it had started to get better. And I was feeling better. I had more energy. I was like, okay, well, this is just going to go away. And so it did, it went away. So about, I, I guess I went through that, I don't know, maybe over the course of two to three months, somewhere in there. So by the time the holidays rolled around, I was, I was feeling pretty good. My husband was deployed in August. So by the time the, the uh, holidays came around, I was in good shape. Mm -hmm. I was feeling healthy again. And so, you know, the year goes on, he's gone, he's in Iraq. Um, I'm, you know, I'm doing the elementary school thing and the job thing and things are going pretty well. We're developing, you know, relationships and, and moving it along. We got a, And we got a puppy. <laughs> we got a new puppy. So um, I'm training this puppy. We already had a dog, but I'm training this new puppy. And part of that, of course, is you take the dog outside. 
Well, it was about time for Jeremy to come home. So it was about a year after his deployment. We were getting into the place where he comes home. And I took the dog outside to do his business. And it was early morning and there was dew on the grass. And I'm looking at it and I can see it. And I realized I can't feel that on my feet. Oh, wow. I can't feel the temperature. I can't feel the water. I'm like, okay, that's weird. And so I just kind of tucked that away. But what happened next was that the, the numbness progressed up both sides of my body this time. And it started in my feet and then inched up my legs and then into my arms until it reached my chest. And at that point, my husband is home. It's October because it was around my birthday. We went out to eat for my birthday and I was just miserable. Mm -hmm. I had, I had this, this strange constriction around my chest. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Right. And so, you know, he went, he, he left, uh, the next week or so for a business trip. My son came down with a swine flu and while he's gone, I'm, I'm taking care of care of Merrick and, uh, I realized I couldn't open the bottle. My hands were so numb. I couldn't do the things that I, I needed to do to take care of him. So I called my husband. I said, you've got to get, get home, get on a plane today and get home. So he, he did, he came home and the, the very next morning I checked myself into the hospital. Okay. I was like, this is not cool. I don't know what this is, but I'm miserable. I can't take care of things I need to take care of. So something is definitely going on. And I had gotten some advice um, while I was going to these doctors that, that, you know, if you find yourself in a place where you feel like you have to go to the hospital, go to this specific hospital because this specific expert works there and you can, that's the way to get in to see him. So I get in, I go to see him, they give me all these steroids. I start feeling better and I'm, of course, I'm shiny and new with steroids, right? Yeah. And um, so I get out, I'm in the hospital for about a week and I get out and, uh, so I start seeing the doctors then, the real doctors, the ones that can tell you what's going on. I'm seeing this neurologist and they're trying to dis decide, you know, it's, it's very, it's very weird because nothing internally is affected, but I'm numb. I'm numb basically everywhere. Right. And so I can't feel temperature. That's a challenge. So getting into the shower with hot water, I could totally burn myself or, or cold water. You know, I just, it, it, it was really bizarre. And so I'm sitting in this neurologist's office and he has done an MRI by then. I've had a couple of them and x-rays and whatever they have to do. I had this horrible test where they stick these gigantic needles into you to try to see if they can stimulate your, your main nerves in your, in your body. They're, they're these long slender needles and I could feel all that internally. I couldn't feel it on the outside. So I, I had gone through all this. And finally, my husband and I are sitting in this doctor's, the neurologist's office. And he says, well, he's like, there are two options here. You either have a tumor on your spine or you have MS. And frankly, you want to have MS. Oh. I said, okay, well, so, and I just immediately started crying. Yeah. No, not like sobbing hysterically, just these like, like these little quiet tears, you know, and I'm like, okay. So he's like, but you know, cause if it's a brain tumor, we can't operate on that. And we can't crack open your spine and, and remove that. That's, you know, catastrophic. So I'm like, okay, so, so I get the bad option. Like I don't get the worst option, but I get still get the bad option. Mm -hmm. So from there, you know, they, they diagnose you after they do what they, what they now call a lumbar puncture, which is more commonly known as a spinal tap because nobody wants to say that anymore, I guess. Um, and there are some proteins or whatever in, in the fluid there that help them identify that it is or is not MS. And those came back positive for MS. I still went to see a neurosurgeon for about a year and a half because they wanted to see if the, the spot on my spine would grow or change at all. And if it did, then that lended itself to a tumor. If it didn't, then that was probably MS. Oh. So that, that's the point I, I got the diagnosis. And that was actually on my son's birthday when I, when I sat down and got that. So I had to come home. I, I came home that night and we had a party for him. I wanted to take a second out of this absolutely moving interview 
to let you know that my newest book is now out on Amazon for pre-order. You can pick up the horror anthology, 12 Deaths of Christmas, today for pre-order. It's coming out on Thanksgiving of 2018. 12 Wicked Tales of Horror, pretty much for any fan of Clive Barker's Books of Blood back in the day. Upscale stores in the middle of New York City that offers its customers more than they bargained for. Prodigal sons returning home for aunt's funerals, only to discover that an ancient entity awaits them. What about a town sheltering against the first snow and the evil it brings? Or a mad king, a hired assassin, a world in the balance, and an eternal force manipulating all of them. This and much, much, much more wickedness in my new horror anthology, just in time for the holidays, called 12 Deaths of Christmas that you can pick up on Amazon now. Let's get back to the interview. That's great. Yeah, you just go on about your business. That that couldn't have been easy. Wow. Yeah, it it was a good distraction, to be honest with you. Um, but, But it was no fun. Right. You know, and then you have to start telling people, you know, and MS isn't one of those things where people understand what it really is. Right. Because it's different and it manifests itself differently depending on where the lesions are in your body. It could be anywhere on your nervous system. Um, it could be in your brain, which could affect vision, hearing, um, and those sorts of things. My, my lesion is on my spine. And as far as I know, I only have one. Um, but it just happened to be in a place that could affect basically everything that I felt. So, you know, all of my limbs and my face and, you know, my entire body, you know, and that constriction I had around, around my chest is what something, what people call an MS hug, where it, it constricts your diaphragm so much that it just stays in that position. It feels like somebody's pun- continually punching you in the gut. Oh, okay. So that was fun. Um, but, to, but, you know, telling, do you tell people, do you not, you look normal, do you, you, but you don't feel normal. It's one of those things. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's what it was. And that was in 2010. That was December of 2010. So was that a, I mean, I don't know how much you've read into this in others' experiences. Is that a common onset? What your timeline, what you went through, is that? considered an aggressive onset do you do you even know for sure it's i don't i don't believe it is i actually have a sister-in-law who has progressive ms what i have they call relapsing remitting so i'll have an episode it clears up and i'm in remit remission for a while and then something else will happen and i'll have an episode and i'll clear up okay um both progressive ms it is what what you think it is it is a progression of you know of things that happen um that you can basically draw a map, a map on, you know, you lose mobility. Eventually you'll lose mobility. A lot of times it, it comes on as a vision issue first, which is what happened with my sister-in-law. She just out of the blue lost her vision because it was on her optic nerve. So, so a lot of people will have, have that, um, vision, hearing, uh, incontinence issues. You know, why, why can't I make it to the bathroom on time? That's, that's awful, right. right? When you've already been normally healthy. Right. My my MS doctor has told me that based on where the lesion is on your body, so if it's in the in your brain and it's inside your brain, um, or inside the spinal cord, then the symptoms you're going to experience are more likely to be internal to you. So the bladder issues, the bowel issues, food issues, digestion issues, swallowing, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if it is happens to be on the outside, which is where mine is, then you're going to have this thing like periphery numbness um, on the outside of your body. So it kind of mirrors the location of where okay. uh, your lesion happens to be. Okay. So one of the inspiring things just through our email conversations and one of the reasons why I was so grateful to you um, to be willing to come on and talk about this is the way you framed it yourself in the emails and listeners, you can probably already guess because you will see the episode title 
um, on your on your podcatcher as you're playing this. But MK, you talked about uh, being spurred on to write. So can you kind of talk us through that growth, if it was a growth, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but that growth of you as a writer dealing with the military stuff, but then having to face the challenges of MS and everything that it presented to you and how that spurs you to write? Sure. So one of, one of the things that happens with my symptoms is that um, my hands are numb. My hands are numb pretty much all the time in varying degrees. If I'm colder, it feels better. If I'm hot, it's miserable. Um, and so I have trouble typing. And the, one of my very first thoughts was, holy crap, I'm not going to be able to write. Mm-hmm. What happens then? You know, I've got all these stories inside me screaming to get out. And, you know, now what? And so I thought, as long as I can do it, I need to be doing it in a way that is imperative. I need to, you know, because there may come a time when, you know, and and yes, there are things like, you know, speech to text and all of those things. They're great. And sometimes I use them. Um, But if you know anybody with a condition, an autoimmune condition kind of like this, that you want to be, quote unquote, normal for as long as you can. You want to do all the things that you can do until you just can't do them anymore. And, and for me, I was like, well, you know, they can't put a timeline on any of the, any of these things. So I might have my hands for 50 years or I might not, I might have them for five. It depends on the progression. It depends on treatment. It depends on, you know, all these variables. So it really prompted me to say, you know, I've really got to get these things done. I don't know how much time I'm going to be able to do this Mm -hmm. to the best of my ability. Right. With, um, everything that you are facing and and have been facing when we talk about support, I mean, it sounds like you have wonderful support structure and that's awesome. How, how does that play into, into this, uh, pursuit, this passion, this drive that you have to create while you can create? Um, I will say that my, my family is, is a great support. I, I will say that they don't, by and large, understand my my push to write mm-hmm. because they're a bunch of extroverts. <laughs> and so, you know, they want to talk about it. I want to write about it. Um, <clears throat> so all of their spouses understand it, though, because, you know, we're all the same. <laughs> um, but the, but they do allow me the time. They do allow me the, you know, the the space, you know, I've got my own little writing room that I can go to and lock, lock the door and, and be by myself and do my thing for as long as I need to do it. I have also been lucky and I will say that I'm lucky that I lost my job last year. I, I worked in higher education for, well, since 1993 in various capacities and I got laid off, which is going to happen. So I took the year and I thought, well, what if I can write? What if I can write for a living? You know, I've got 20 stories stashed on my thumb drive here. Maybe I should start to finish them. And so I I started to do that. But I also thought, well, you know, writers of writers write everything. They write website copy. They write, you know, policy and procedure. They do all these things. And so I, I started up a little company, a little media company to allow me to do those things and make some money at them as well. And that's gone fairly well over the course of the year. Um, I'm to the place where, you know, I'm making some reasonable money at it. Got a couple of really good clients and, you know, it may at some point turn back into a full-time job. I don't know, but that's a decision I'll make if it happens. Right. So, so, but the support from my family has been, has been really good. Um, yeah, my mother-in-law uh, lives with us. So we have, we have her in the house. Uh, we have, of course, my son is 18. He's in the house. And of course, me and my husband. So there's four of us here basically all the time. And, and um, it's it's good. I think I think sometimes in my push to to be so normal and to not be affected, I end up kind of negating the fact that I that I do have some limits mm-hmm. as far as temperature goes and energy levels go and things like that. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not bad off by any means, but there are just a couple of, especially with the, the energy levels mm-hmm. I'm finding is, is a challenge. So, and, but, but I, I try to appear so normal that sometimes I know that people don't think about it. Right. Me. How do, how has that 
affected or changed the the technical approach that you have to writing? You know, some people have to have that that concrete structure, certain times, certain places, etc. For you yourself, as you went through your journey with this, how did that affect you? Did any of that change? Have you become more dedicated or identified uh, what you need more easily? Or are you still the same writer today that you were before? Well, I mean, I would like to think that I'm more dedicated to it. I think definitely in the past year I have been more dedicated to it. Um, you know, I've still got all the other life things going on too as well. So it, it, it is always going to be a challenge to me. And, and maybe I will. I'd like to kind of maybe start getting up at six o'clock and sitting in the chair and knocking out a couple of hours a day. I find all sorts of reasons not to, like everybody does. Um, but, you know, my, my son will be joining the military this summer, so he will be, be out of the house and on his own very shortly. Um, so there's another layer of things that I, I'm not, you know, yes, I'm going to have another set of worries mm-hmm. with all of that, but it won't be the same set of circumstances I have now. Please tell me he's joining the right uh, service. Which would be the right service? The Air Force, <laughs> of course. Air Force, of course. Actually, actually the, the interesting story is my husband joined the Air Force first, and he spent a few years there, got oh, really? out, and then he be, became an, an Army reservist <laughs> after that. So, um, no, my son is joining the Marines. Is he really? Okay, so yeah, I can definitely understand um, what you're talking about there with the, the whole new set of concerns. Sure. Definitely. Sure. Um, so... When do you are okay? Let me see if I can frame this fairly to you. Are you fair to yourself? And I mean that with the utmost of respect to to what you're going through. I know I can get blinded with the I can do it rah rah attitude. I have the luxury, knock on wood, of being relatively very healthy person. For you, do you give yourself those types of allowances? Have you found that to be helpful or or not? If you do. Um, no, I don't give myself a whole lot of wiggle room. Okay. I will, however, say that I know when I've had enough, you know, so I know when it's time to fold up the tent and pack it away. Um, but no, I, I, I like a set schedule. I like to, to make progress. I like to see progress in everything I do. It doesn't have to be, you know, I'm going to write 5,000 words a day. It doesn't have to be that kind of progress. Mm-hmm. But at the end of a week, I want to be able to look back and say, yeah, I've used this available time to, to spend it with my family in a valuable way, to spend it on work that will make me some money, and to scratch my creative itch with mm-hmm. the writing in a valuable way. With one of the things that I love about this show is, you know, it's other writers coming on and giving practical real life uh, tips, tools, tactics, and advice to other people. There's going to be, there are, there will be people listening to this uh, with MS, without MS writers, and they're going to be hearing your story. And to them, maybe even to those people who out there who are listening, they're listening to your journey, and maybe they're going through something similar to what you're going through. When, if I should say, if you get that, you know, that inner critic, that really critical, horrendous, harassing voice in the back of our brains. Um, that that tries to discourage you from uh, pushing through and being spurred to write and to create while you can. Can you share any experiences, any advice, any tips that have helped you to kind of squash that voice and so that you can continue on and press on? Sure. I will. I will start by saying that the business of writing is not what people write for. <laughs> right. Most writers I know or have contact with don't love the business of writing, you know, the business end of it. We want to create something. We want people to love it or hate it, I guess, but, but we don't want to have to then become, you know, the publisher, the seller, the marketer, the, the everything. Mm-hmm. And that's the part of it that drags me down oftentimes because there is so much out there trying to get noticed, trying to get your book reviewed, trying to do this, that, and the other thing. You know, it is really, you can bog yourself down with that crap. Mm -hmm. And what I found since losing my job is that I I don't want to spend all of that time on social media doing X, Y, and Z. You know, I'm, I'm finding that I enjoy being on these 
particular platforms and that's where I'm going to spend my time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to be a limited amount of time because I have other things to do. So, so the business of writing is what drags me down more than anything else, mm-hmm. I think. Um, and it can get discouraging because if you self publish, then you have the mechanism whereby to see how many books you're selling. And so, you know, oh my gosh, I've only sold four books this week. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, nobody, nobody loves me. You know, you can have your right. Eeyore moment and all that. But at the end of the day, I'm not writing so that somebody else loves it and buys my book. I'm writing because I'm miserable if I don't. Yeah. I am not the same human being if I do not write. My, my family will tell you if she is not writing, she is not happy. She is not, you know, content. She is not available in ways that she is available when she is doing that thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, it's discouraging sometimes because you can't get to the level you want to get at. I'm not supporting myself on my books yet. Maybe one day or maybe not. But that can't be the reason I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. It, It just can't be. And that's the advice I would give people. What is your why? Why are you doing it? If you're doing it to bake the next bestseller, I can guarantee you it's not going to be the next bestseller. It's right. just not because you're doing it with the wrong intent. What is the reason you're doing it? If you have your why and your why is correct, then everything else you do should be about that. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's awesome, and I'm gonna probably have to meme uh, that quote. I don't remember exactly how you said it, but when I listen back, I'll be able to about you know if I don't write, I'm miserable or whatever it is. I totally get that. <laughs> I absolutely get that. Okay, yeah. listeners, at this point of the, of an interview, what I like to do is I like to thank my guests for coming on and sharing their experience, their journey, and any advice that they have for you by putting them in an awkward position and asking them about a horrible writing experience that they themselves have had. If this is uh, your first episode, maybe you're a fan of MK and you're checking out her uh, interview here and you've never heard this show before, you might be wondering why, one, why did she go on a show called Horrible Writing? And then two, why is he asking her to share a horrible writing experience? That's so mean. No, au contraire. The reason I do this is because these are the folks out there who are doing, they're creating, they're, they're enriching the world by putting their stories out there. And I want to show that they have done that through everything. MK has shared her journey so far, but the horrible writing experiences are a neat way to show that even the best of us fall on our face from time to time. We do something silly. We do something incredibly embarrassing or whatever it may be. And yet we continue on and we continue enriching the world with our stories. So in that spirit, MK, what is your horrible writing experience? My horrible writing experience, um, when I first started taking writing seriously and thinking, well, maybe I can publish something. Maybe it is worthwhile. You know, I joined this online critique group and it was fabulous. Very supportive. I found nothing but support in the writing community. So this isn't about that. But I, we would submit our chapters to one another and, and critique back and forth. Okay. So we did that and there's this one lady on there and and she was trying to get me to understand what point of view was. Mm -hmm. And I just, whatever roadblock I had in my head, I could not understand what she was talking about. I couldn't get wrap my mind around what point of view was. And it got to be pretty funny after a while because she was critiquing, you know, she, she went through my chapters and she would, she would highlight, here's where you're head hopping. Here's what you're doing. I'm like, I, and I just couldn't get it. And so finally she kind of puts in all caps out there. She's like, your horse cannot have a point of view. <laughs> and I was like, and, and that was the light bulb moment for me. I was like, Oh my gosh, she's right. I am looking at this scene through the eyes of a horse. You can't have a point, you know? And then, then I started to understand it. The funniest part of this story is that, Fast forward, you know, 10, 15 years, she ends up being my editor at Karina Press when I published in 2009. And she kind of remembered me and kind of didn't because I had gotten married since then, changed my name and everything. And um, and I was like, don't you remember? I said, the girl who couldn't figure out what point of view is, she's like, oh, my God, it's you. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> it's you. I said, yes. Do you see that I figured it out? She was like, yes, I see that you figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah that was a moment I, I just have these moments blonde moments or whatever that I cannot get around it was the same way about rounding numbers I can figure out how to round numbers and so 
I mean, I was in tears. My dad trying to teach me how to round numbers Mm -hmm. took me an hour to figure it out. And then then when I got it, I got it, you know, not all good, but that whole point of view thing, man, it took me weeks to wrap my mind around that. See, and I think that's important to one, thank you for sharing the story. That that's cute. The you know your po- your horse can't have a point of view. Maybe that's the quote I'll throw out there before we release this episode. But it's I mean it's so listeners. I mean this is this is the gem of the show. Is you know M- MK's out there doing it has done it. You know meaning putting stories out there into the world. But this is coming from a person earlier in her career who just couldn't grasp the point of view thing. Sometimes I think, you know, us writers are just hor- absolutely horrible to ourselves that we're way too critical um, ab- about what we don't do right in our writing. And I don't think sometimes we step back and look at the complexity that is writing. There's so many facets to it. So MK, that was a great story that you can master all these other things and your story's just not going to go forward because you've got a point of view from a horse. <laughs> right. <laughs> And and yet, listeners, again, the end of the story is she's published now and uh, and, and continuing to go out there and put stories in there. So wh- wh- whatever, whatever your roadblock is, that that brain block that you have, you can get over it. You just got to be dedicated and you got to work and you got to write, folks. You have to write. Now, speaking of writing, MK, before uh, we let you go, I'd love to actually take a moment to have you talk about your work, the things you've done some of the uh, work that you've got out there that folks can go check out and maybe tease even something that you might have coming out in the future. Sure. Um, I've got, uh, I re-released a series of books that I had published, uh, oh, probably the early 2000s. And I got the rights back to them and and have put them back out again. Um, And they are set in the, uh, the American South, in the early 1900s. And so I've created this little fictional town. You've got all these lovely characters. You've got murder and mayhem. You've got bootleggers. You've got this whole this whole vibe going on there uh, in small town America. So I've got three books that in that series, I call them the Brighton books um, because that's the little town they're in, it's Brighton, North Carolina. Um, and I've got three books right now in that series, uh, All in Good Time, The Bootlegger's Bride, and Tied Together. So I've got three books there. And the latest one I've put out is a new series for me. It's called Crashed. It is a contemporary romance, and it is set in um, Charlotte, North Carolina, where I lived for about a decade. So I love going back to these these uh, cities that I've, I've lived in, and, and I'm going to focus in my next couple stories on a, on a couple other cities in what they call the new South. Uh, one will be set in Charleston and then the third one will be set in Nashville. Okay. Very cool. And, um, listeners have no fear, just like always, I'll make sure that I, um, get MK's links and make sure that we put those up in the show notes for you. So MK, now that folks have heard your story and they've found out more about you as a person and as a writer, and you shared so much of yourself, they're falling in love with you. How can they find you out there on the internet where you want them to find you? Because I earlier on, you mentioned that you're not necessarily all about the business of being on social media. So right, right. only as you're comfortable sharing, how can they find you? <laughs> right, right. So the easy way to do it is just visit my website it is MK as in Mary Kate, which is not my name, mkchester.com. Um, and you can find uh, all my social media links are there. I am on Facebook. I have a fan page. I am on Twitter. I enjoy Twitter a great deal. Um, I do have a Goodreads page if they'd like to find me there. And, you know, I, I share stuff from Pinterest, you know, cause I'll, cr- I'll collect images related to the books I write and things mm-hmm. like that. So there's, you can find social media links there. You can also find all my bio links on that website. Perfect. MK, one more time. I want to thank you. This was again, powerful, encouraging, and maybe, I don't know, most importantly, em- empowering because, uh, you've shared a lot about what you've gone through and what you're going through and you're continuing to create. And I think that's w- one of the most important messages we can do as a writer community is to encourage each other that regardless of what we're facing, we can, if we have that desire, we can still do that. So MK, I want to thank you um, for your time, obviously, but coming in and being so candid and open about your story. I really do appreciate it. And I truly do believe that you helped someone out this morning. Well, I hope so. I hope so. And Paul, I mean, I have, I appreciate the venue too, because this is really not something I talk about in, in great detail at any point in time very often. 
But so it's been good for me too. It's been good for me to, to revisit it and, and talk about it and reaffirm some of the things I'm doing. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse at Writing Horrible and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. Suck less.